Uh, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name's uh, Ocean Quigley. I'm the art director and creative director on the new SimCity. Uh, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the uh, kind of the, the art of the game, the motivations behind the art of the game, and the uh, uh, sort of the techniques and tricks that we used to, uh, to render everything and to make it as well. So uh, I'm a, uh, a longtime art director at Maxis. Uh, I started working on SimCity back in uh, like 95 or so, uh, early enough to work on the Sega Saturn port of SimCity 2000. So there's a, a kind of the high point of my resume there. Um, and before that, I was the, uh, the strudel cook at a, a restaurant. Uh, let's see, I went and art directed uh, SimCity 4, uh, SimCity 3000, uh, SimCopter, and in fact, the lead engineer of SimCopter is sitting here in the room with us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Streets of SimCity, a whole bunch of other games that have Sims in them. Sims, The Sims, Sims 2, and so forth. So, uh, yep, so there's a lot of techniques that have carried over from earlier SimCities, but a lot of stuff that we had to reinvent. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, a bunch of the sort of the different sorts of content in the game. Uh, SimCity is a game that's built out of a, a lot of little bits and pieces that assemble, and we have to worry about all those sort of all those art assets independently. Uh, so there's, you know, there's the trees that make the world look green and alive. There's the little sims that are walking around. There's the, the roads and bridges that you as the player draw across the landscape. There's the vehicles that are, are driving around. Uh, there's the, the signage and lots that uh, um, you know, give visual detail and variety to the world. Um, there's landscape. Uh, some cities, you know, at some level, uh, a game about landscape and the things you do with a landscape. Uh, my, uh, my formal background is as an oil painter, uh, and I, I still do uh, landscape painting on the side. So landscape stuff is, uh, is near and dear to me. There's, uh, there's buildings, uh, and there's really two classes of buildings. There's the, uh, the buildings that you as the player kind of make decisions about, you know, that you plop down, that you purchase, that you upgrade, that you transform in various ways. Uh, we call those ploppables uh, in-house. Uh, I tried to get that term to be player-facing, but uh, too many people thought ploppable had some distasteful connotations. Uh, then there's, uh, there's the RCI buildings. Uh, in SimCity logo, uh, RCI is just residential, commercial, and industrial. So those are the buildings. I always think of SimCity as a gardening game, actually. You know, you're kind of creating this landscape, and then you're trying to cultivate these buildings to grow in the landscape. The, uh, the RCI buildings are the, the flowers that grow in your garden. You know, they're not buildings that you own. The, the little sims who live in the city, they own those buildings and make those buildings. So they have a different job to do than the, the buildings that you've put down yourself. Um, so that's the sort of content that I'm, talking, that I'm gonna talk about, uh, along with a bunch of additional details. But uh, the kind of primary question that underlies it all, uh, and that I think as, a, as an artist or art director, you have to think about is, well, what, what functional job is the art in the game doing? In a game like SimCity or other you know, sandbox games that are composed of a, a multitude of little interconnecting parts, um, every piece is doing a job, and you have to figure out what that job is. Um, I'll contrast briefly uh, the art in this new SimCity with the art for SimCity 4, which was kind of the last uh, SimCity I art directed. Uh, in SimCity 4, you know, our buildings were high poly 3D models that we, we rendered and baked out into sprites uh, and then projected onto low polygon cards. So we could make those buildings sort of arbitrarily complex. You know, we, we, we'd spend millions of polygons on a skyscraper because it's a sprite and it doesn't much matter that it's going to be, uh, that it's going to be rendered out and onto a card. Um, and so for SimCity 4, my aesthetic was just pile on detail, you know, detail on top of detail, model doorknobs, model doormats, uh, model the, the latches on windows, because um, at some level, the player will perceive that. Uh, but that, that detail didn't actually mean much in the early SimCity, uh, in the early SimCities. It, you know, you'd see uh, cars parked in front of a house, and, uh, and it didn't mean there was anybody there. You know, you'd see uh, a child's playset in the backyard, and it didn't mean there was a child there. So the detail was visually complex and visually rich, but uh, at some level it was vacuous. It didn't actually tell you what was going on in the simulation. In this new SimCity, I wanted to have the detail really mean something. Every time you see a piece of art in the game, I wanted it to, to tie back to what was actually going on in the simulation. So 
you know, you look at SimCity, uh, it's a big landscape with all these buildings in it, and it looks like a city, and you think of it as a city, but at a deeper level, it's really UI. You know, the buildings are doing a job, and the job is telling you what's going on in the simulation. Uh, there's all these data views and stuff like that to give you deeper representations, but uh, <coughs> at root, all these buildings are doing the job of telling you, you know, how's your city doing in this particular spot? What's growing there? What's dying? And so forth. Um, so for the buildings, you know, they, they need to do jobs like show you what's the category of the building. Is it, a, is it a residential building or a commercial building, an industrial building? Is it a fire station? And they need to show you state. You know, uh, is that building under construction? Is it abandoned? Is it doing fine? Is it on fire? Is there, uh, is there a qu crime wave happening there? So the, there's sort of category stuff that the buildings need to show you and state stuff that they need to show you. Um, and the sims, you know, they're, they're sort of what brings the city to life. You see all these little people walking all over the place, but they're doing a job too. They're trying to show you, well, sure, where are people in the city? Where are they commuting and walking about? But you look at a sim and you need to be able to see, you know, is that a, a poor sim, a middle class sim, or a rich sim? And what, what, what's his job? Is he a fireman? Did he just get fired from the hospital? Uh, is he an industrial worker? So uh, the, every piece of art, every asset that goes into the game has to answer this fundamental question, you know, what are you doing for the simulation? What, what are you representing in the simulation? The terrain's showing simple stuff, you know, like where can I build? Uh, and where are resources embedded in that terrain? You know, is there water over here? Uh, is there ground pollution over there? Uh, would this be a good place to put my water pump? Stuff like that. So here's a, a little example of what I'm talking about. Uh, in previous SimCities, we'd bake all these things into the lot. Uh, in the new SimCity, all these sort of things that are there on the lot around the building, you know, the, the garbage cans mean that there's garbage in that building that's ready to be picked up. Uh, when the garbage is picked up, the garbage cans goes away. Uh, if there's cars there, it means there's somebody at the house right now. So the, the little detail is there um, to communicate what's going on in the simulation. Here's an example of what I mean by, uh, well, both building category and building state. So uh, on your left there, you see uh, a bunch of industrial buildings, and they're low-density, low-tech industrial buildings, which need to differentiate from all the other industrial buildings. Uh, and on your right, you see those same buildings again, but, uh, but they're abandoned. Uh, and so you need to be able to read those states unambiguously uh, in order to play the game. Um, and we came up with all kinds of techniques, which I'll go into in a little bit of detail uh, later to, uh, to describe how we take that same art asset and mash it around in various ways to make it look abandoned without having to do additional production. So this game is mostly pictures, or this talk is mostly pictures, but I've got a few more slides to, to hit. Um, so I want to talk about the technical constraints uh, of making the art in SimCity. The, um, the primary one is that uh, all the artwork uh, has to work when spammed across a huge landscape, right? It's not enough to make a beautiful building or a high polygon sim or an attractive vehicle. Whatever technical solutions you come up with need to, uh, need to work in the sort of the worst case scenario where you've got these things all over the place and, uh, um, and the player's machine can't grind to a halt. So we had to come up with techniques to deal with those constraints. Um, like every game, we've got poly count and texture uh, usage constraints. Since it's a sandbox game, the player can do things that put you in a really bad situation. Uh, so we had to come up with schemes to protect against those, uh, those worst case scenarios where you know, every different building type is in the game uh, and every highest detail building is in the game. Um, and uh, for things like sims and trees, you know, it wasn't enough to have a, a scheme that that lets us put a sim up or put a, a tree up. We need to have schemes that would let us have thousands of trees, forests of trees going off into the distance, and potentially tens of thousands of sims walking around. Um, so I'm going to move on to the first category that I'm going to talk of in detail, so buildings. Uh, buildings are kind of the heroes of SimCity. They're the most charismatic asset, probably. Uh, they represent, far and away, the most production effort. Uh, probably we spent more we spent more time on the buildings than we did on every other, uh, uh, every other art category put together. Um, briefly talk about the building constraints. As I mentioned, we had a limited texture budget, uh, so uh, we couldn't afford to make unique textures for every building. We had to come up with schemes to share a small library of textures across huge categories of buildings. Um, we uh, um, had that problem compounded because uh, not only you know, couldn't we afford unique textures for buildings, but each building had multiple texture channels. You know, there was a, a normals channel, obviously, for lighting. There's diffuse channels. 
There's, uh, there's depth map channels. There's uh, various specular maps and so forth. So even a little texture, like a little 256 by 256, by the time you, you, uh, uh, you know, array it over all the other textures that are being used, kind of becomes a giant 1024 or 2048, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you've got you know, a few hundred building types to, uh, to get across, it, uh, it adds up. Um, since it's a PC game, batching is a huge constraint for us. You know, we've only got you know, 1,000 batches, 1,000 draw calls, maybe. Uh, this is a game that has to run on your dad's computer, so we, we can't count on uh, uh, really super high-end machines. So, um, so we had to come up with schemes to, uh, to group all the buildings into big chunks so that we could draw them in single draw calls. Um, and the poly count is crazy. I mean, we had, um, we had to make we had to figure out how many polygons we could afford for a building by looking at how much real estate a given building would take up. So, uh, you know, a small building on a small plot of land uh, uh, gets a few polygons, and a, a big building gets a lot of polygons, so that you're, uh, you're kind of getting an even polygon density across the whole landscape. But what that means is that, uh, you know, an ordinary middle class house only, you know, you've got, you got a couple hundred triangles to build it with. Uh, I mean, that puts us back in the PlayStation 1 days. Uh, and it was a little bit of a shock for the artists who are used to doing kind of high poly work and sort of uh, more generous environments to suddenly be told, no, no, you've got, you, no, really, you've got 200 polygons to make this building with. Make it look good, please. So I'm going to talk about the, some of the techniques that we use to do that. Um, so quick, quickly, here's a, uh, an overview of a bunch of the residential buildings in game. In, you know, the buildings go from high density to low density. They go from rich to poor. And so there's this kind of a matrix that needs to be filled in the state space of all these different buildings. Uh, here's the same thing for commercial buildings, you know, going from skyscrapers to uh, little taquerias uh, and going from, you know, opulent, uh, high-end, gleaming skyscrapers down to, um, you know, kind of crude brick buildings. Uh, and here's the same thing for industrial buildings. So industrial buildings go from being uh, sort of high-tech, gleaming factories down to sort of 19th century mills uh, and from little itsy-bitsy, you know, kind of workshops all the way to, to giant industrial conglomerations. Um, like I said, we were really polygon constrained in making these buildings. And so we had to come up with schemes to, uh, to make buildings that look rich and complex and detailed uh, that, that look as good as the sorts of buildings that players have expected to see in other games that don't have these sorts of constraints, because the players don't care, you know, that you've got these constraints. They just want to see something nice. Um, so there were, there were three or four techniques that we used a lot, uh, uh, just to hit them off. The, the first one was a technique called facade mapping. And facade mapping is where you take a little library of architectural elements, like doors and windows and little bits of trim and walls and columns, and you dice them up and you make them into uh, kind of a library of elements that you can reconstitute across a big, you know, space without having to, uh, without having to pay for unique textures and without sacrificing texel density. That was one technique. Uh, another technique that we used a lot of uh, is this, uh, this relief mapping technique. And relief mapping is kind of like a step beyond normal mapping where uh, you're not just affecting the light, you're, you're making the surface look like it pushes in and comes out. Uh, so it's kind of like displacement mapping, except you're doing it all in the, in the pixel shader. So uh, that's a, a really great technique for making a surface look complex and resolved and detailed uh, without paying for the polygons. I mean, you're paying for it in the pixel shader, but uh, you can always uh, turn that stuff down on lower-end machines, and you can always turn it down as the camera pulls out. So it's a, it's a great technique. And another technique that we used, it's really cheap, is, uh, is interior mapping. So interior mapping is, uh, and I'll talk about all these things in a little more detail in a little bit, is where you take a cube map uh, and you kind of rip off the face that you can't see because it's behind you when you're looking into the building, uh, and you, uh, you pack it all into uh, a, you know, a, a little 64 by 64, 32 by 32, and then you array it, and then you, uh, you uh, look up into that texture as the camera moves around, and it gives you the, uh, the illusion of, uh, of interior space in the buildings. Um, so I'll talk about all those in a, in a minute. Here's an example of uh, the um, kind of the, the architectural pages that went into those facade elements. So, um, so we looked at given architectural styles, so just take an architectural style at random, uh, uh, so Art Deco skyscrapers, like the Chrysler Building, for example, and you say, what are the common repeating motifs in the Chrysler Building? You know, uh, what do the windows look like? What do the doors look like? 
uh, what, what are the, what's the vocabulary that you'd need to make the, the facade and fenestration of the Chrysler building? And then you have an artist who's got kind of an architectural sensibility, and we hired a bunch of architects on the project. Uh, uh, basically isolate those, diagram them, uh, and then we go and, uh, and model them all in Maya. Um, so uh, we made these kind of palettes of, uh, of the architectural elements for every architectural style in the game. And there's like 50 or 60 different architectural styles in the game. Uh, and we wound up um, having to model them in Maya because we really needed all these different channels. You know, we needed uh, n normals. I mean, I guess you could hand paint normals, but who wants to hand paint normals? Uh, we wanted ambient occlusion for the small scale detail, you know, like the areas around the windows. Uh, and most importantly, we wanted depth, and nobody wanted to hand paint depth maps. So it was just easier to model all the stuff in Maya to the same scale uh, with the same depth values and so forth. So we've got a, uh, a little pipeline where the artists would you know, build these and then, uh, uh, and then render them. Uh, and here's an example of what one of those textures looks like on a flat polygon. So this is just a quad. This is just two triangles. Um, but you take that depth map and you uh, project it onto, uh, uh, onto that quad and you take the color map, which we palletize, so those are, not, those are false colors there. Uh, and you get this compelling illusion of sculpted detail. I mean, you spin around that thing and, uh, and stuff comes out and stuff goes in and it, it, looks like, it looks like more than two triangles is really what I'm trying to say. Uh, and that was the key because we needed to get this detail without, without paying for it uh, in, in polygons. Here's a, let's see if I can play this video. Here's a little video of what I'm talking about. So this is a low poly building. Um, you can see there's not a lot of polygons, but this is the highest LOD version of it. When we turn on the facade mapping, you start getting those kind of elements like, you know, the windows show up and the repeating elements show up there. And then when we turn on the relief mapping in a second, we turn on the relief mapping, there we go, um, the windows go in, you know, and you get this uh, sort of sense of the walls having thickness. You know, it's not just a cardboard box with windows painted on it, all of a sudden it looks like the windows you know, are embedded into the building. So those are techniques that we got working fairly early in the game, and uh, they saved our bacon. I mean, they gave us a, a, a potential you know, mechanism to do buildings at the level of detail that we needed to. Let's pop to the next one. So here's an example of how our first cut at that facade mapping technique went. Again, facade mapping is where you cut out little bits of doors and windows and you arrange them across the surface. So uh, we came up with a little facade grammar. Uh, there's a, been a bunch of great graphics research in this domain, so we, we cribbed from a bunch of it. Um, that facade grammar let us do things like define a tile and the extents of the tile inside the texture page and then use that tile to, uh, to build uh, kind of a wall with its, you know, its, its frames and its doors and its windows. And the thing that was cool was um, if you look at the, across the top there, there's you know, five different buildings. They're all using the exact same facade rule. Those facade rules are smart enough to, uh, um, to repeat windows as many times as is necessary to fill the space or to get rid of the windows when the space gets small. So it was a really flexible and uh, general technique. Uh, and I'm kind of a tech nerd for artists, and so I really got off on this. I thought this was a really exciting way to work. Um, you know, you could make these little rules, you could assign the rules to, to surfaces. Uh, that surface could be dynamic and do all kinds of things. And uh, I, I was really excited by this, and I showed it to the art team, and they're like, are you kidding me? What? <laughs> you, you want me to work in Notepad? Uh, and uh, um, no artists uh, would even touch this stuff with a 10-foot pole, uh, despite extensive lobbying on my part. So uh, the first thing we tried was, well, well, it's cool. We'll make a front end for it. You won't have to work on text files very much. Uh, so uh, one of our engineers, uh, Dan Moskowitz, made a little kind of WYSIWYG front end to this, this system where you could kind of like mark where the tiles are actually with a tool instead of typing in you know, uh, coordinates to six digits of precision. Um, and you could uh, see kind of the, the, the rules play out. And so we, we made a front end. Uh, and here, I'll show you what that front end looks like in practice. Uh, here, you know, you see the, um, the uh, as, I, as I change the rule by pulling that little slider back and forth, all the, the walls that are using that rule dynamically update. So I, I took this to the artist and said, <laughs> we're in business. Check it out, guys. Uh, and uh, uh, they uh, said, Maya or death. So, uh, <laughs> so we, we said, okay, fine. 
Uh, so we, we simplified it a lot. We had, like I said, this really extensive grammar about how to compose doors and windows and stuff like that. Uh, and the artist said, no, I don't want to learn a grammar. Uh, just give me uh, a tile picker where I can extract the doors and windows from the building and kind of put them onto, uh, onto the building in a way that I can see. Uh, and so uh, my uh, sort of holy grail here of having a bunch of programmers slash artists make this project came crashing down to reality. So we wound up doing something like this, uh, which was informed by those early discoveries, uh, but, uh, but fell well short of the kind of the complexity and kind of techno nerd uh, coolness factor that, that I wanted. Um, another technique that we used a lot of was the interior mapping stuff. That's what I mentioned to you earlier. So here you can see you know, a bunch of those textures. There's five textures here that are just being projected onto that quad, and it makes the quad look like um, there's kind of holes going down. Here's uh, a, a little video, the first time I got it working. Um, and again, this is, this is a quad. You know, this is just, this is just two triangles. Uh, and by uh, scooting those uh, kind of the, the vector that you're looking into the uh, interior map with, you give this compelling illusion of, uh, of an interior. Um, it's really limited. I mean, there's only a few things you can do with it. For starters, uh, you can only paint the walls and the floor. Like, there's nothing inside there. You can't put a, a chair in the middle of the room. Um, you can't have somebody walk around inside that. I mean, it's just a cube map. That's all it is. It's a cube map that's pretending to be a room. Um, so if you use it for that, you're in business. And if you start thinking that it's more than it is, then um, uh, as, a, as a developer, then you wind up tying yourself in knots. But we used it for all kinds of things that are maybe a little bit unexpected. Um, so if, when our buildings go into interior states, we wanted you to have, or when, our, when our buildings go into abandoned states, we wanted to have uh, kind of, we wanted this to be really unambiguous. We wanted you to be able to look at a building and say, oh yeah, that's an abandoned building. So yes, they look like abandoned buildings in Chechnya or something like that. But, uh, but they're abandoned buildings. And uh, the, uh, so we had this technique where we made these decals that we could kind of slap onto the side of the building. But the, the decals had interior maps underneath them. So you'd put this decal on top of the building, but the interior map would convince you that you're looking into the hole, you know, into the inside of the building. Um, it's kind of like the, the portable holes from those uh, uh, Roadrunner Wile E. Coyote um, cartoons, you know, where you, the, I guess Wile E. Coyote would buy them from Acme and stick them on the side of a cliff, and, uh, and the Roadrunner would run right through them. So this was a really cool technique, and we used it a lot to give you the, uh, the illusion of basements, you know, going underneath buildings, the illusion of holes that were punched into buildings. Uh, you know, any time we needed to convince you that there was an interior volume, that was the kind of the go-to technique. And uh, we could vary. So we eventually wound up, and I'll show you in a sec, we eventually packed all those interior maps into big atlases. Uh, and then just by changing the lookup into the atlas texture, we could, uh, we could show you stuff. We could make it look like lights, you know, were going on or going off, or like the interior was a, you know, black and burned out hulk. Um, I wanted to have little flipbook animations for interiors that are on fire, you know, so that you could see, uh, you know, uh, the, the inside of the buildings catching on fire, but the graphics engineer <laughs> said, no, no, you're not going to do that. Um, but one of the things that's cool here is that we're driving the, the percentage of the building that has uh, uh, lit windows by simulation parameters. So when there's a lot of people in the building, you, uh, you see the, uh, the lights on, and when there's uh, just a few people, more lights are off. So it's kind of like a thermometer you know, for, uh, for showing you the state of the building. And uh, we, could all, we could twiddle that stuff cheaply and dynamically. Um, see, so on the, on the right here, you see an example of one of these interior map atlases. And since there's different states, there's also additional channels that I neglected to put up here. But since you've got these different states, you can, um, you can just pop between them uh, uh, with UV lookups. So uh, here's an animation of just, you know, flipping the lights off and on in the buildings. Uh, and that gives you a lot of variety relatively cheaply. We, we drove the particular configuration of it with a random seed that was seeded by where the building was in space. Um, so each one is different, even if you see two copies of the same building. And here I'm just stripping the facade away so you can see what those interior maps look like with no building you know, on the outside of them. Um, and there's a lot of shimmery crap over there, but that's, those are areas that the player never saw because there was opaque facades on top of it. So it's a good, cheap technique. Um, and any time, I'd recommend it, any time you've got stuff that you can't really see in detail, you know, the player's not going to walk up to that window and, and look into it. You just need to give the suggestion of interior detail. Um, it's a kind of a go-to technique. Uh, 
Um, another technique that we used a lot uh, is, uh, is palletization. Um, we used it across pretty much every asset category uh, because we only had the time and the budget to make a, you know, a lot of buildings, but not an infinite number of buildings. And we wanted to extend that, uh, um, the visual variety of the, uh, of the art that we did make. So instead of uh, sort of uh, hard coding colors into those facades, we palletized them and could mix and match them. So in the, you know, in the foreground here, you can see you know, those four buildings are the same architecture and the same facade rules and all that. Just you know, by twiddling up the palettes, you get some mediocre variation. It's, they look different, they don't look super different, but you get it essentially for free. Let's see, I'm gonna talk about animation here a little bit as well. Um, so when I was a kid, my, uh, my grandparents had this big model train layout down in the basement, uh, and I'd go down there on summer vacations and, uh, yeah, I'm probably telling more about myself than you need to know, uh, and play with these, uh, these, these model trains and the little buildings in the model train set. And there were essentially two categories of buildings. There were the buildings that just sat there statically and you'd look at them, and those were the boring ones. And then there were the buildings that had little cranks and you could turn the crank and make uh, stuff happen, you know, conveyor belts would move around. And those were the buildings that, uh, that were the most fun to play with. And so when it came time to do the art direction for SimCity, I wanted to make as much of the city animated as possible. You know, I wanted to have all of those buildings feel like they were the, um, the high-end model railroad buildings that I played with as a kid and not the sort of the static boring ones. So, um, so we had a pipeline where the artists could you know, make regular boned animations. Of course, we've got batching limits. We can't just naively play all those bones back, so we converted them into, uh, well, into vertex data, into morph channels that we could scrub between. So the artists had to do all their animations with two keys. Um, this is sounding like an exercise in artist abuse, but uh, they, they grew to love it. Um, Here's uh, an example of those uh, animations in action. And we bound all the animations to simulation data as well, just like we did with the lights. So you know, as this little power plant is consuming coal and uh, making power, you see the animations play. Um, if it, I'll just debug cheat to make the coal go away and the whole thing stops animating and turns off. Uh, in fact, it's maybe a little hard to see in this light, but, uh, but there's a mound of coal there that, that fills back up again. Uh, that's also an animation channel. Uh, even the effects stuff up at the top is being driven by the simulation. So we had all these animations, and like everything else in the game, it, the animations have to do a job, and the job that they're doing is to kind of communicate what's going on in the simulation underneath. Um, another technique, and this is, I think, a really good technique for sandbox games in particular, or at least games that are dynamically composed of lots of little bits and pieces on the fly, is uh, ambient occlusion. I mean, Yes, we're all using ambient occlusion in our games. There's nothing revolutionary about that. Um, we did a, a little bit, something a little bit fancier because uh, the screen space ambient occlusion stuff always has got a kind of an embossy quality I don't like. Um, so we came up with a volumetric ambient occlusion technique that has the virtue that you know, as you put two buildings together, the alleyway between them darkens. Uh, and so that took a bunch of kind of graphics research from one of our lead graphics engineers. Um, as a result, it came in pretty late. Uh, and it was actually stressful because we had the game looking kind of like it does over there on the left with no ambient occlusion. Uh, and the various EA execs would show up and go, uh, uh, what are you doing? You know, this, 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 we can't ship like this. And I'd be like, no, trust me, ambient occlusion is going to come in. It's going to be magic. Uh, and uh, um, I was able to hold off the, uh, the panic until ambient occlusion did come in. And, uh, and it, it, in fact, it made the game look a million times better. For these games that are using lots of little bits and pieces, uh, I think of ambient occlusion as spackle. You know, I mean, it's kind of the thing that kind of grouts everything together and makes it look like, instead of being a, you know, a jumble of random crap situated across the landscape, it makes it look like it's uh, one unified scene where everything sort of goes together. So uh, yeah, ambient occlusion was the secret sauce here. Okay, so that's buildings. Uh, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, lots and signage. Uh, it's a little bit odd maybe to combine them like this, but we used a lot of the same technologies for both. Uh, specifically, we used Valve's absolutely rocking and spectacular sign distance field technique. Uh, uh, those uh, sign distance fields are where you take a high resolution uh, source image and you convert it to a very, very small distance field and then you can reconstitute a relatively crisp version of that in the pixel shader. So it lets you take these textures that would otherwise have to be, you know, uh, well, you know, 512s or 1024s on disk and, uh, and 
crunch them down to like 32s by 32s or 64s by 64s, thereby allowing us to have you know, hundreds of different signs in the game. So the way that worked was uh, you know, an artist would go in and they'd make high resolution art uh, in channels. So you'd say, okay, you've got a you know, RGBA, you've got those four channels, and each one of those channels would be palletized and they'd kind of sit on top of each other. So we hired an artist who had a lot of experience doing like screen graphics, uh, like old school silk screen style printing. And we looked at a bunch of reference material that was like, uh, you know, like constructivist posters from the 1920s and 1930s, or old WPA style posters from the 1920s and 1930s, because those artists had the similar limitation. You know, you've got, you've got four solid colors, you can lay them on top of each other, uh, and that's your art, basically. Um, and uh, the signage is doing the job of uh, conveying to you <coughs> activity and state. So here's a little uh, uh, animation, which I'll turn on in a sec, but you can see even if we did have hundreds of signs, we couldn't afford to give each business a unique name. So I, I punted on that and decided to give category names uh, to the signage instead. So a sign will tell you, hey, this is a, a low wealth, low tech building, or this is a, a high wealth industrial building, or so forth. So names like small business uh, are um, maybe a little dorky, but they were there to tell you, hey, this is a small business. I mean, duh. Um, so here's a little AVI. Once you've got those sign distance fields, you can use them <coughs> uh, in all kinds of clever ways. Like you can scrub the sign distance field and uh, animate the signs. Uh, you can overdrive the brightness of them and get neon. Uh, we've got a, a deferred renderer that we could uh, take those distance fields and treat them as, uh, as, as lighting. So they actually light things around them. You know, you can change the alpha of them. Uh, let me just, you can change the alpha of them and, uh, and make them look like faded signs on uh, old brick buildings. So this is a, a really good technique, and like I said, it was driven by the constraints. The constraints are, okay, you've got, you know, you've got maybe two 2048s for all the signs in the whole city. How are you gonna make that work? Um, lots and lot textures are doing exactly the same thing. You know, you've got a really small pool of texture memory to use, uh, but you want to have crisp hardscape features. You know, you want to have parking lots and paths and all this detail, uh, and you can't afford to do it uh, uh, naively. So we made uh, sign distance fields like these ones up here. Uh, in fact, that, that is uh, like a 2048 that's crunched down into the four channels, RGBA, you know, 64 by 64. And instead of, uh, instead of tinting them with solid colors, we use them as masks for, uh, uh, for diffuse textures and normal map textures. So, you know, be like, okay, here's where the asphalt goes, here's where the concrete goes, here's where the grass goes, uh, and you'd uh, kind of assemble or build up the hardscape features uh, like that. I'm not gonna spend too much more time on this because I wanna move on to lighting. Um, so, like I said, we, we wound up doing a deferred render because we wanted to have thousands of lights in the scene. It's kind of that same problem of scale that uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, each building uh, has got a bunch of different light components. We had a, uh, a, a lighting artist um, for the whole duration of the project whose job it was was to load up a building, figure out what it would look like if it was lit properly, and then hand place you know, the dozen lights for every building, uh, which is kind of interesting because before that happened, the, uh, uh, the only way to play the game, you, know, you played in the daytime because when it got to be night, you couldn't see anything and it was all ugly. But after Sherry was done doing the work, um, night became kind of the most charismatic time to play the game because you get all these little twinkling lights and all the lights coming on and cars driving through them and stuff like that. Um, briefly, uh, we, uh, we've got a sort of a tool philosophy at Maxis where, um, where even though you might make all these crazy front ends for various, uh, for various tools, you, in the end, uh, uh, write the data out as plain text so that you can, uh, so that you can edit problems manually, you can see if it's screwed up, you can make changes and reload it. I mean, sure, when the game gets shipped, that all gets turned into binary, but in the uh, production process, it's really a, sort of a, a point of pride that we have all of our data uh, accessible for tuning and for hand manipulation, if necessary. We also did a, um, we also did a global uh, illumination solution. Uh, Andrew Wilmot uh, brought in a spherical harmonic style lighting environment. Uh, that was fed by a sky simulation. So we made the, we implemented the, in, just in a pixel shader, the Utah sky model, which is a beautiful sky model. I mean, it, it takes into account things like the, how much pollution is in the air, how high the, 
what's your latitude, how high the sun gets in the sky, all that stuff, and it spits out a, uh, a, a really nice looking sky. Uh, and then you can just drive that uh, lighting model by that sky, uh, and everything sort of falls out of it naturally. And you get this kind of unified, coherent lighting environment. Uh, here you see, you know, like the hours right around dawn, uh, and you know the particles are lit, the trees are lit, uh, everything is lit by the same uh, lighting solution, including the atmospherics. So here's a, a little image of you know when all the lighting came together, uh, and especially when it's animating, you have this kind of a little wonderland of lights blinking off and on and activity. So I'm running short of time here. I'm going to pop over to vehicles. Uh, vehicles is another major asset category. Uh, we had one artist, Michael Long, who's a, a longtime SimCity artist. He worked on SimCity 4 uh, as like, I don't know, a 12-year-old or something like that. Uh, and uh, uh, he was one of the lead artists on The Sims 2 and a uh, and fantastic artist. So he built almost all of our vehicles. Uh, here's a, just a little sampling of some of the vehicles in game. Uh, the vehicles are doing a job too in the UI. You know, they're telling you, well, this is a fire engine or this is a police car obviously, but they're also telling you for the civilians' vehicles that are driving around, they're telling you if this is a, a, a low-wealth car, or a medium-wealth car, or a high-wealth car. So if you've got a city you know, with lots of high-wealth sims in it, they'll be driving Rolls Royces. And if you've got a city with a lot of low-wealth sims in it, they'll all be driving beaters. Uh, and that's stuff that you need to be able to see at a glance. In many ways, the vehicles are the simplest asset category. They're just you know, low-poly models that are built in Maya uh, with a bunch of textures associated with them. Um, the uh, the textures are kind of the obvious things. You want, you know, where the windows, uh, like everything else, we palletize the cars to get cheap variety. So instead of hard, hard coding uh, colors, we make uh, masks that we can dynamically retint. Straightforward stuff. The only thing that I want to mention about the cars that's cool is that we, we continued to abuse that interior mapping technique to take these low poly cars, which are really just low polygon cars, and kind of make them look at least like um, nice die cast model cars where you can look into the window and see the, uh, the seat inside there. So here's a little video of the first time I got that working. Uh, same car on the left and on the right, but where you've got uh, the interior map, there's a pretty compelling illusion of at least there being something inside there. Uh, it's not just a, um, you know, it's not just an opaque window. It's, uh, uh, it's I don't know, maybe a seat, maybe a dashboard. Uh, I mean, obviously you can do better if you model everything, but this was free, uh, and free was good. Here's a, a little AVI of, uh, of this stuff in action, um, which will load. Here we go. So you can see uh, you know, by having masks for where the tail lights are and where the headlights are, we could turn those off and on um, and get a, kind of a little bit more drama and dynamism from the environment. Um, in a second, I'll just debug, cheat the lights on here, and you'll be able to see the interiors. There we go. And so the same, these are tiny textures too, little 128s by 128s for each car. Um, here you see the same car, the Rolls Royce, the black version and the white version, just you know, repalletized or retinted. Um, I found that once the traffic simulation came in and we started having cars drive around, I'd lose hours to just watching cars at intersections. Uh, it's uh, kind of got this uh, strange pulsing hypnotic quality. Uh, let's see, another asset category I want to talk about is the trees and the sims. So just like the, just like the lots and the, and the signs are really the same technology under the hood, the trees and the sims are the same technology under the hood, and they're driven by the same motivation, which is there needs to be thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Um, let's see, here's a little, here's a, an image of uh, uh, the, sort of some of the early prototypes of the trees. One of the things that I wanted to get with the trees was a strong sense of lighting on them. You know, I wanted them to look like little like little broccoli florets. You know, you kind of hold this thing up and it, it's not just a, a spray of texture. You know, it needs to have a lit side and a dark side. And so I, um, I just used uh, bent normal techniques, you know, make a, make a bowl uh, and then project the normals from that bowl uh, onto the tree. Um, not rocket science, it's just another cheap hack. Um, but I've got a workflow on my blog for anybody who wants to see the cheap hacks. Um, but it was a good hack. Like it, it made the trees look properly volumetric. Um, and not like, you know, just, just flat sprite cutouts. Um, and uh, the trees also needed to show season, right? Uh, so it's one of the indications of passing time. So we wanted to be able to scrub the alpha channel of the tree and make the leaves go away. And like everything else, we wanted to dynamically retint them so that you uh, can get spring, summer, and winter, and fall out of the same art asset. So also straightforward, like not, not a particularly big deal. 
the, the problem was is that we need to do it at this scale, you know, where, um, where there are trees going out to the horizon, uh, where there's you know, maybe 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 trees in the environment. Uh, and you know, they, they can't look like sprites. They need to look like full 3D trees that you can spin around, you know, that you can light from various sides um, that, uh, that, uh, that kind of are embedded in the landscape in the same way that everything else is embedded in the landscape. So, uh, so this was what we eventually came to, and I'll talk about the techniques that we used for that uh, momentarily. I'm just going to pop ahead here to a little video of Sims doing the same thing. Uh, so with the Sims, you know, again, it's fine to make one Sim, but we need 10,000 Sims or 20,000 Sims. Uh, they all need to be animated. You need to be able to rotate around them and believe that they're physically 3D and present in the scene. You need to be able to light them from various sides. Um, you know, they need to look like... Uh, like solid little people there in the world. So uh, the, the technique that we eventually came to, I mean, I guess it's kind of obvious, the technique that we kind of came to was imposterization. And imposterization is where you take a, uh, 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 either a sprite or a low poly model that you're rendering in a buffer, and you project that uh, onto uh, a bunch of cards um, like this. So here is one of the early mockups where I was trying to explain what I wanted to do. So these are just a bunch of cards. As the camera moves, the cards turn to face them, uh, and the uh, the texture or 3D model that is you know that is driving the texture is dynamically updating to give you uh, kind of a, a consistent face as you move around it. So um, uh, so you can do that you can do that if your camera is constrained just with a library of sprites. But our camera wasn't constrained. Our camera could go you know all over the place. So we needed to do it uh, in the more expensive way. So here's a uh, what I'm talking about, uh, on the right-hand side there, you see uh, the buffer, uh, a real-time 3D buffer. You know, I, think it's, I think this is a 512 by 1024 uh, that's being rendered you know, every frame with a, a library of 3D characters. Um, and, uh, and then those, uh, those little you know, bits and pieces from that texture are being projected onto all those different cards at runtime. And since we've got normal maps as well, we're relighting them. So this technique works great if you've got more than 150 sims, like every frame, we're rendering 150 low polygon sims into that buffer. So, uh, so if you're only rendering 10 sims into your city, uh, you, you've lost, right? I mean, you're rendering uh, 140 more sims than you need to. But if you're rendering 10,000 sims, uh, then that's the only way you can do it. So, uh, so this is a technique that encourages um, excess. You know, it's a technique that says, well, it's much better to have uh, the, the city flood with sims than it is to um, to just have a few, because we're paying for them anyway, so spend them. Um, and uh, let's see, let's slide over here. Here's the, uh, that imposter buffer uh, blown up a little bit, so just, I'm spinning around it dynamically. Um, you know, we rendered uh, three sets of characters, you know, men, women, and children, um, three sets of animations, you know, the idle, a walk, and a panic run. We rendered heads separately, so we could mix and match heads on different bodies. Um, and uh, this is a great technique for doing stuff at scale. Uh, it sucks if you're just doing a few of them, but if you've got to draw thousands of them, it works great. One of the limitations of it is, is that, um, you know, I've only got eight rotations on those sims. So even though you can spin the camera freely around them, they're always walking in a cardinal direction. You know, they're always walking north, or they're walking northwest, or they're walking west. And usually that's not a problem. Like usually uh, there's enough of them that the blinks between s sort of the orientation uh, is concealed, but if there's one sim and you're looking him walk down the street, you'll see occasionally, you know, blink from one uh, uh, orientation to the next orientation as he goes. That was just the price that we had to pay, and we palletized these guys just like we palletized everything else in the game, uh, so that the one low poly sim, and since we're rendering 150 of these every frame, they are really low polygon sims, kind of like pipe pipe cleaner model sims. Um, we had to uh, palletize them uh, to give you different outfits, to make a policeman look different from uh, uh, a surfer dude uh, with the exact same source asset. So by having a kind of a, a, a palette that we could palletize so that you know, like only the, the hand is flesh colored or maybe the flesh color goes all the way down the arm or it goes all the way over here, it becomes a tank top, you can take that same source asset and turn it into uh, you know, a bunch of different out, out, outfits. Um, so here's the, the same source asset. Uh, being palletized to make a bunch of low wealth sims. Um, yeah, that palletizing technique is pretty good. And because you've got normal maps um, that you're also paying for every frame, 
you might as well just light them. So here the trees are being illuminated dynamically by the, you know, the light from the fire engine, uh, as are all the sims. Uh, so the, the illusion of solidity is pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, here with these sims walking around, you know, since they've got little normal maps as well, uh, they are lit by the, uh, by the dynamic lights plausibly. You know, the left side of the sim is lit or the right side of the sim is lit and so forth. So all those assets, despite being kind of convoluted and having to jump through all kinds of weird hoops to build, are in some sense standard assets. You know, they're built in Maya, they're exported through normal pipelines, they're rendered. Um, there's another category of asset that's fully procedural in SimCity, uh, uh, roads. And so the roads are sort of built dynamically because we don't know what you're going to do as a player. You know, you could do all kinds of crazy stuff with those roads and there has to be some kind of uh, solution. You know, you, you do a road draw and you just expect it to work. Um, underneath the hood, there is untold hours of pain and misery to make that road draw work. Um, but from your perspective as a player, you don't care. You know, you're just doing a road draw and you expect that road draw to succeed. So the, um, with systems like this, it's kind of interesting because with everything previously, you're kind of art directing artists and you're kind of art directing engineers and you're trying to describe the systems that you want. With systems like this, you're indirectly art directing the player. You know, you're making uh, um, a system that the player is going to use and it needs to look good as a result of, you know, whatever the player does. So you're, you're kind of art directing on stilts. You're trying to give the, the player a system that will make something beautiful without them having to be artists. Um, here's uh, kind of the the way that we worked out what uh, the roads should do uh, as they cross different sorts of terrain, you know? So if you, if you draw over a hill, what happens? If you draw over a valley, what happens? And what happens is we dynamically build additional geometry to uh, support the draw. Um, here's what it looks like in practice, you know? So some player goes and they do kind of random draws across the landscape uh, and uh, we procedurally build uh, all the bridges and tunnels and road cuts and so forth to support that. So it was interesting because early in the project I had to mock all this stuff up and it was a you know, pain in the butt to mock all this stuff up, you know, height fields in Maya. And then when it eventually started working in game, it was kind of magic. You know, you could just do this draw and these hours and hours and hours of labor that you do in a mock up just all happened instantaneously. Um, that stuff is, is kind of satisfying for me. Um, in addition to kind of the terrain road interactions, you've got the road road interactions. So, uh, you know, a, uh, a player draws an avenue and then they cross that avenue with a, a two-lane road and, you know, they expect to see some sort of intersection as a consequence. Um, and so we had to think really hard about every additional road type that we added to the game because each one, you know, would multiply the number of intersections with all the additional roads uh, in a, a way that's pretty unsustainable. So the same artist, Mike Long, who made the roads, uh, or who made the cars, also made the roads. Uh, and that was um, a, like a, it was a pretty um, unpleasant task because we didn't give them any tools to do it. Um, like all the other things, you know, we have to pack all the textures for the roads into small little pallets. So that's, you know, those are all the texture assets for, uh, I don't know, a two-lane road, for example, normal maps and diffuse color. And then um, you've got these text files where you kind of snip out little bits and pieces from that texture and assemble it. Um, you know, so if, if this road crosses that road type, then you go to you know, this line over here and use that set of textures. And we wound up having thousands of lines of kind of description like this. Uh, um, probably in, in the low numbers of thousands of lines, probably 6,000, 7,000 lines of, uh, of that texture, that texture, that texture, oh, rotated that texture and so forth. Um, continuing the tradition of artist abuse. Um, the, uh, the bridges are more or less the same thing. Uh, they uh, are built out of bits and pieces and components uh, because we don't know what kind of bridge you're gonna draw. We don't know where you're gonna put it. We don't know any of that stuff. So we give you a library of components and it's gonna be up to you to draw it and then uh, we have to dynamically assemble it. So that was uh, um, another uh, lot of text files to do. In retrospect, we should have made uh, proper tools for Mike Long. He probably spent weeks doing the stuff he didn't need to, but uh, we're a small team. Terrain's another procedural asset category. Um, you know, typically you just use height fields, uh, and we did. Uh, we used, uh, whoops, let me, uh, we used height fields, but the height fields uh, are supplemented with all these other secondary resource maps that show you things like where the water is in the terrain, uh, where forests are in the terrain, uh, uh, where's ground pollution, and so forth and so on. 
And for that, we used uh, uh, one of my favorite programs, uh, World Machine, which I think is kind of industry standard for building terrain. Um, a quick shout out for World Machine. Um, it's got these sort of natural uh, phenomena style filters like hydraulic erosion and, uh, uh, and thermal erosion. And so you can give it like a picture of your dog as source material and then you erode it uh, and it looks like Utah. I mean, it's, it's amazing how crappy your source material can be. Uh, and with those, uh, with those natural erosion filters and whatnot, it just makes it look like terrain. And then uh, you can route the, uh, the texture into various subtextures. You know, you can process it in various ways. So you can derive like where forests go and uh, where wet terrain is from that source texture. And one of the, the things that I particularly enjoyed doing with this was, you know, given an arbitrary, given an arbitrary height field, try and figure out where the rich people would like to live. Um, and so it was an exercise in uh, sociology, you know, like, well, they want to live where there's good views and close to water and on the edge of forests, but they don't want to live on big flat areas and so forth. Uh, so, uh, so we derived sort of maps uh, that the simulation used from the source height field. And then um, once those height fields were dumped into game, we processed them further. Uh, one of our engineers, Bill Flugraff, he made a, uh, a hydraulic erosion simulation that would dynamically, uh, you know, at, at first we thought this would be something that we could afford to do at runtime in the game, but it turned out to be too expensive, that would dynamically cut and crease terrain. So uh, if you think back to SimCity 2000, one of the things that was really nice about SimCity 2000 was, you know, the terrain told you where you could build. If it's flat, you can build there. If it's 45 degrees, you can't build there. So the terrain was doing a great job of communicating to you what the you know, what the buildability of it was. Um, even though we got a much more naturalistic aesthetic than SimCity 2000, I wanted to have that same, I wanted to telegraph that same sort of buildability to you. So we, we kind of worked to build these sharp, cuspy sort of cliffs uh, that would kind of cascade down and tell you, no, you, you can maybe build a road here, but you're not gonna build your power plant on this cliff. Okay, onward to um, a bunch of the sort of stuff we did after we made all the assets. So we got all these assets, we got this library, this grab bag of stuff, uh, and we need to kind of glue it all together and assemble it all together to make it look like one beautiful, coherent, unified scene. Um, so here's the raw output uh, of the frame buffer. You know, with all, of these, all the labor that I've described, um, you dump it all into the world and you uh, see what it looks like. And what does it look like? Well, it looks like crap. Um, because, uh, you know, it is still just a bunch of stuff spewed into the landscape. It doesn't have anything binding it together and unifying it together. So, uh, so here's, and this isn't necessarily in pipeline order. I apologize to the graphics engineers in the room that are gonna say, what, your pipeline did it like that? Um, these are just the steps. These aren't the steps in the order that the GPU does them. Um, so the first thing we do is we uh, tone map it. You know, we're, we're generating a high bit depth image. You know, it's a frame buffer is 16 bits, and so you can expose it. Uh, and we looked at all the filmic tone mapping techniques, and there's some really good ones that are easy to find. Uh, so we tone map it into a, kind of a nice exposure. Uh, and then uh, we color grade it. And I'm gonna talk about color grading a little bit later um, in the five minutes I've got remaining. Um, the uh, uh, color grading is great because it takes this sort of, all these different colors that your, uh, that your artists made and sort of unifies them into a coherent color space. Um, we got this technique, this color grading technique working really early in the game and I was like, sweet, I'm gonna turn on color grading and I turned on color grading and then all the artists worked around the color grading, you know, so I made everything kind of like a nice warm, tone and then all the artists made everything really cool to compensate and so I wound up with this like chasing your own tail situation. Well, I'll make it warmer. Oh yeah, well we'll make it cooler. Uh, and so if I, I'll turn off color grading until you can't make any more changes uh, and then I'll turn color grading on. So I mean it's kind of one of those things that's obvious in retrospect. Um, we, uh, since we have a high dynamic range frame buffer, uh, we can you know bloom out the highlights. Uh, it doesn't do much for you here in this daytime scene but at night with kind of headlights and stuff like that, it really makes the scene a lot richer. Um, shadows. Once we got shadows working, um, you could start to read the sculptural forms of the buildings a little bit more. Um, you know, the scene is starting to come together at this point. Uh, the, the buildings sort of had this cardboard box quality to them, and once you got shadows on them, they, they at least look like lit cardboard boxes. Um, but like I said earlier, uh, ambient occlusion was the special sauce. You know, once you turn ambient occlusion on, then um, the whole scene suddenly anchors itself and, uh, and comes together. Um, yeah, I can't speak highly enough about ambient occlusion. Uh, then uh, we turned on atmospherics. 
and the atmospheric stuff is informed by that same uh, lighting model, that same Utah sky model is also driving the atmospheric. So, you know, if you look towards the sun, you get a lot of uh, bloom in the atmospherics. And if you look uh, away from the sun, things fade out. Uh, it's a great technique to give you kind of spatial separation to make the foreground be different from the background uh, and to make it feel like, you know, you're in a space that you can breathe in. And then uh, even though not everybody likes it, we also use depth of field to uh, uh, further separate the foreground from the background. I like it because I like model trains and I kind of come from that nerdly little world. But uh, but we turned on depth of field to give you a, a stronger spatialization, you know, to make the foreground be distinct from the background. Okay, since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to race through. Uh, oh, and we do lens flare because we don't have any pride. Um, let's see. Uh, so color grading. Uh, color grading is fantastic. We use the, the color lookup table technique, the CLUT technique, which is common now. You can find it, uh, references to it anywhere, um, where you, you know, you've got a color cube that you sort of unfold and turn into a strip, and then you can process it in Photoshop uh, and then reload the color table uh, and, uh, and do all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, so this was a color transform in Photoshop where I just kind of washed away all the colors that weren't orange uh, and uh, cranked the contrast. And you wind up with a game that looks kind of like, well, there was a movie that sounded a lot like SimCity. Uh, and this is inspired by that. Um, but you could also do kind of like, well, uh, platinum photography, complete with the uh, kind of the um, solarization effects, you know, when the contrast gets really high. So this was, you know, a, a color lookup table that makes the game look like glamour photography from the 1930s. Um, and if you've got colorblind users, and you all do because they're about five or six percent of the population, uh, and your game is using color to communicate information, you can do a bunch of color transforms, the Daltonization transforms, and there's just there's plugins in Photoshop for them. You don't need to do anything clever. You just run them, um, and then when you load that color table up again, um, the colors that would be normally imperceptible to colorblind users uh, are visible. So I like this particular one. This is for uh, people who. Uh, who don't, who, who are only, uh, who don't have any blue receptors. Um, it's a horrible, horrible color to look at for me, but, uh, but for people who don't have blue receptors, it makes the game playable. So we did, uh, you know, there's, there's three common forms of color blindness, and we did the, uh, the transforms for all of them. Um, so I'd say you should do that because it's cheap and easy, and it makes the game accessible to people who couldn't otherwise play it. So quickly to wrap up, um, I'd say that, um, let's see, I'd say it's not playing. So I'd say the first takeaway here is that uh, as an art director on a big project like this, you have to understand what job every piece of art is doing for you and, uh, uh, and kind of get that clear before you start production, because otherwise you're making stuff that might or might not have any utility for the game you're making. Um, with sandbox games in particular, you've got all these bizarre constraints. Uh, and if you just kind of naively say, well, this is how I'm going to make the art, then you come crashing into those constraints when you try and do it at scale. So uh, it was really crucial for me on this SimCity to work with graphics engineers and get a sense of what the constraints were and then work with them for solutions. And then um, those solutions are often completely unusable for artists. Uh, and so it takes a bunch of time iterating on them to make them acceptable uh, and accessible to artists. Um, and then it just takes time once you've got that sort of system up to, to bring it to fruition. And so uh, identify your problems early, uh, work with engineers early, uh, get the crappy system in front of the artists early, and then uh, hopefully you'll have time to cycle through uh, the inevitable uh, toothing problems of it. Uh, and then uh, don't be too proud to unify the scene in post. Uh, you know, there's so much you can do. Even if your art looks nice, you know, to start off with, it'll look a lot nicer after you've done it in post. And if your art isn't all that great initially, by the time you get it through post, it can actually look pretty good. So that's my talk. Thank you all for uh, attending. Um, so I, uh, I want to say uh, we've got, uh, just as a gratitude for all of you coming out, we've got uh, these cards. Let's see if I can find one here. That, uh, that they'll hand you on the way out that are good for a free copy of SimCity. So they look, well, they look like business cards. So those nice fellows will give them to you on your way out. And uh, I'll be up here until they kick me out, which is probably like momentarily. Uh, so I'll have uh, time to answer individual questions if you've got them. But thank you very much.